see if we are live, y'all. Okay. So I believe that we are now streaming. Hello everyone. We are now live here on YouTube and we are now waiting for a few of our people to come in. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am setting up for today's class. Just getting on. I do apologize for my tardiness today, y'all. We're going to let a few people get on and we are going to get started. We're going to have tons of classes going on throughout the day i'm working on my camera setup it actually failed on me so i am working on that and we will be live in about maybe five or six minutes that will start today's class let a few people start coming in Okay, what is going on here? You start streaming on slow. As you are coming in, let me know where you're from. And if you are currently sublimating or if you are interested in starting to sublimate. Okay, so now we can connect. Let me know if you all can hear me. I know that y'all can't see me, but let me know if you can hear me. So we are going to go into the camera. Um, let's deactivate and reactivate the camera. Hey, y'all. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. I'm coming. We are. I had a few camera issues this morning. Y'all know I tell y'all on this channel. We don't have all the bells and whistles, but the information is always on point. Right? The information is always on point. See y'all are coming in. Okay. I see y'all coming up in here. Y'all are ready today. We are going to start this video at actually at um, it's 11.06. Let a few more people come on and we will start the master class at exactly 11.11. 11. Grab a few things right quick. Turn this AC on because
we have five minutes well four minutes i'm gonna grab a drink so that i'm completely ready for y'all and i don't have to make any pipe noise Okay, some shout outs to y'all. So while we are waiting here, I'm going to tell you guys and girls, ladies, um, about how today's classes are going to go. So to, in today's classes, we're going to have several classes throughout the day. I'm going to start off the classes myself because I'm going to dive into what is sublimation and explain all of that stuff and everything that you need to sublimate. We're going to go through that and then afterwards we're going to take a break at some point and then we're going to start having product demonstrations where we're going to be doing that. Um, today's class is going to entail a lot. It's going to entail a lot and I'm hoping that we can get through everything. Um, after we do the product demonstrations i did not realize y'all that i was hosting this class on uh memorial weekend so we are going to dive into applications and markets for dye sublimation we're going to talk about niche markets that you can get into uh when you're into sublimation and uh, finding your niche items that really, really make the money, cost analysis and different pricing strategies. We're going to talk about marketing and sales techniques. And then we're going to talk about some legal and ethical considerations that you want to consider, things you want to consider when you are sublimating. And then we're going to discuss and do critiques and share, uh, share uh, experiences. Now, the business aspects parts of the class is going to be held on Tuesday and in order for you to take a part in that class you will need to have a rising boss membership that is a class where I'm going to be diving deep into um, the business side of sublimation so if you are needing to get your sublimation business off the ground and you want the real tea from tea that is the class for you to jump into, and that is going to be for the boss members who are here on uh, YouTube, and that membership is $9.99 a month. So if you want to jump in that class, feel free to jump to, to sign up for the membership, but you don't have to have a membership to take part in this class and to get the basics, and you're going to get a lot today. Okay, y'all, it is 11.11. Uh, so we're going to get ready. Well, it is 1110. So we're going to get ready to start. Um, hey, everybody. Hey, Tampa. Tampa is going to do a demonstration later on today. And I will be joined by uh, Mel Miner. She's going to do a, a little minor design. She's going to do a demonstration today. And any members who are um, who are members of the channel paid members of the channel if you have a demonstration that you would like to do today and you want to help out the boss feel free to let me know and i will uh set up a time to bring you on camera so we're it's 11 and we're going to pretty much do sublimation classes throughout the day so when i tell you guys okay i'm going to get off i'm going to tell you what time i'm going to come back and then we will resume to the next class Okay, so let's get started.
Hey y'all, I'm Latana Robertson. I'm a technical consultant in Dallas, Texas. Now y'all, I specialize in technical training. And when you, when you're, so today's class is going to be a little different from maybe some of the other classes that you've taken because we're going to really dive into sublimation and we're going to get down dirty okay into the knit and grits of sublimation we're going to figure out hey what is sublimation and all that good stuff so let's talk about some things okay so we're going to start out with what is dye sublimation you may be thinking about starting a t-shirt business or a custom uh decorated business uh, decorated items you want to decorate on custom items and you really don't know what sublimation is Sublimation is a full color and permanent customization process for creating personalized gifts, apparel, things like awards, uh, promotional items. That is what sublimation is used for, okay? But the actual sublimation process is going to begin when your sublimation inks, your solid inks that you have printed on a piece of paper, like this when these inks heat up to 350 degrees or higher that's when these inks turn from being a solid ink and it will turn into a gas state and it will permeate permeate onto your substrate that you are printing onto when it cools down it's going to turn back to a solid thus leaving a permanent adhesion to the product that you are sublimating onto. Um, it adheres permanently onto polyester or polyester coatings, uh, creating a permanent bond with the object that you are printing on. Today, we're not going to talk about any type of hacks here because we are talking about true sublimation, okay? So we're gonna talk about sublimation directly printing onto poly things i will talk about printing on dark shirts at some point because you're going to need that information now the key word is polyester right polyester or poly so in order for you to use sublimation printing you're going to need an item that is made out of polyester or it's going to have a high content of polyester or poly coating. Um, many hard substrates like mugs, tumblers, photo panels, those have poly coating applied on them. Um, and most of the poly uh, goods that you're going to be able to sublimate on like this here, this has a polyester coating. Now, I recommend, I don't recommend trying to coat things yourself. I recommend buying goods that are already pretty much coated because we're not going to, like I said, we're not going to really talk about hacks so that you have a professional product when you're getting ready to sublimate. There are some things that you can add on to things. We may talk about that in a later video. Um, let's see here. So when you are sublimating onto t-shirts, right? Because a lot of people that are now getting into sublimation want to sublimate on t-shirts. And I'm going to be honest with y'all. When you're getting into sublimating on t-shirts, you need to sublimate onto 100% polyester t-shirts in order for you to get the best results, right? The best results is going to come from sublimating on 100% polyester. You can sublimate on things like a 65% poly, 35% cotton, 70% poly. Um, the less polyester in your garment okay the lesser the the higher the amount of polyester in your garment right it's the better results that you're going to get so of course at a hundred percent you're going to get the most vibrant look at 80 percent you're going to get kind of a vintage look once you drop down below that 65 percent you can expect to get a vintage look now with that being said i have successfully 
um, sublimated onto items that are 50% polyester, 50% cotton. However, this is what happens when you're doing, when you're sublimating onto items that are not 100% polyester, right? Um, some shirts will not take the, the poly, the, the cotton, some shirts, it will not take, it will not adhere properly because when you have fibers, right? Let's say you have the fibers, you have the cotton, you have the polyester, right? And it's entwined. If I sublimate onto a Gildan 50-50 shirt, right? Those shirts, I may get more cotton, that ink hitting onto more cotton than it is onto polyester. So it really depends on the type of weave that your, that your, uh, that your manufacturer, when they have put the shirts together, what type of weaves that they're using. So that's why I've been able to successfully sub on the Jersey brand shirts because it's something about those shirts where I believe that the way that the weave is done, you're getting, you're hitting more of the polyester. You have to test that for yourself. But again, the best result is going to come on 100% polyester. When you wash those shirts with the cotton in it, after the first wash, you only need to wash it one time to know what's going on. Because when you wash that shirt, whatever dye is not adhered to the polyester, it's going to wash out of the shirt. And so then you're going to get that vintage look. Whatever look you end up with, that's the look that's going to stay and the look that's going to be permanent. So I hope that that makes a lot of sense. Now, one of the big draws of sublimating onto t-shirts is that you do not have a feel with polyester. I'm wearing a screen printed shirt today and I don't know if y'all can see it. Okay. So I'm wearing a screen printed t-shirt today and my shirt has a feel to the shirt. It's a nice soft feel because we do a soft feel here. This is a shirt that uh, Benjamin printed and he did a really, really good job on it. This is my first time wearing it. It's been washed several times. It doesn't have any cracking or anything like that. But had this shirt been sublimated, right, I would not have any feel. Now, the problem with sublimation is that if I want to sublimate directly onto this purple shirt, let's say this, this shirt was polyester, this shirt is cotton, but if this shirt was polyester and I want to sublimate white ink directly onto this shirt, I could not do it, right? The only way to get white ink from, to get white from sublimation is for your substrate to start out being white, right? So which means that this shirt would have to be white and then we would have to do a all over sublimation print to turn this shirt to purple or do a print, what's called a uh, print and cut sublimation where they cut the shirts. The shirts are actually, you know, you're cutting the actual fi uh, fabric out and then making the shirt. So that's something that most people are not going to do. So something like this, if you want to do a shirt like this, the only way that you would be able to get this white is you have to have start out with a white substrate. What a lot of people do is that's when you come into using things like printable vinyl, which is made not just a regular inkjet vinyl. It has to be a printable vinyl that is specifically formulated to take on the sublimation inks, right? But it's still starting out as white. So I hope that that makes money, right? I hope that that really, really, uh, I said makers money. I'm looking at somebody's comment. <laughs> I'm always talking about making money. So I hope that that makes sense and that that explains um, some of the limitations of sublimation, right? So no process is no process is perfect, right? So there's no white ink. Make sure that you understand that, right? No white ink period in sublimation. There's not a white ink that you can put in it. So anytime that your customers come to you, if they have a design that has white ink in it, you have to look and say, okay, 
the best thing for me to do is start out with a white shirt. Now, people ask me all the time, can you, well, can I print on other color shirts? Of course you can, but you're not going to get that white and colors are going to blend in. So for example, let's say if I wanted to print on, and I believe I may have one here that I'll show a little bit later. If I wanted to print on a yellow shirt and I wanted to print blue ink onto that yellow shirt, right? Because that shirt is yellow, my blue ink now, which is, let's say we're using just a standard blue ink, my blue ink now has turned to green because if you go back into your colors, yellow and blue makes green. So just know that the color of your shirt is going to cause your final product color to shift, right? When you are setting up those colors. So you need to, you know, you just need to know things like that and you need to learn that so that when you are sublimating on products, you're able to show these things to your customers. Now, when I was doing a lot of sublimation, I had samples. So my recommendation would be to do product samples of prints showing how sublimation changes. So you may have, and you don't have to buy um, a bunch of shirts or anything like that. I would get a couple of different colors couple of different fabric swatches go to walmart or whatever place that you purchase fabric go to go there and buy different little slices of polyester right in different colors and then you can print on now you have to be careful with polyester um some polyester y'all will not take sublimation listen to me very carefully some polyester will not take sublimation and you may have never heard anyone say that, but I'm going to tell you this because there are some polyester fabrics that are made for the textiles industry for like interiors. Um, let's say for example, you have a um, material that is going to be outside, right? And so that material is actually made of polyester, but that material is made for outdoor furniture, right? For people who are, um, for um, designers who are designing outdoor furniture. That material may have a special coating on it to repel water and things like that. When they put that special coating on it, it's sitting on top of that polyester. So when you sublimate it, it's not gonna sublimate. So if you've ever purchased like, um, a bolt of fabric and let's say for example you want to do a tablecloth things like this you have to be careful of you want to do a tablecloth and then you got there and you did that sublimation and it did not work that's what's that's what's going on um, I always recommend that if you're buying if you're sublimating on fabric and then turning that fabric into goods for you to sell is to just do a little test print you don't have to um, Test your sublimation products by doing like if I wanted to do a sublimation design on this cup and I'm new to sublimation, I may just put a little design on the cup, right? That way I can test my heat settings here. And then if that doesn't work, if I don't get the perfect heat setting, guess what? I can still use the same cup, put another design, another design, another design, another design, because this stuff is expensive. I see a lot of people who will... Do a full tumbler and you get it wrong. And then by the time you get it right, you've gone through 10 tumblers and now you're out of money. So whenever you buy a new product to test, you always want to make sure that you buy something extra so that you can test that product, right? To make sure that that product is going to sublimate. And y'all, we're going to talk about sublimating in large quantities ways that you can do that also um later on in the as we go through now um polyester sublimation also requires uh your finish that a finished product contains polyester right uh which means you're not going to be able to sublimate on cotton we've talked about that 
wood, glass, anything else that does not have some type of polyester coating. Those are going to be your drawbacks. Um, the last thing that you need to know, um, and maybe it's not the last thing, but one more thing that you need to know um, that I can think of is that the substrate that you're printing on, right? It must withstand heat of 400 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll have people that will say, well, I've sublimated at 350. That's fine. But I'm going to tell you, you want the item to be able to take heat of 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, reason being is that you can have some polyester materials, some poly coated items that will sublimate uh, propylene, for example, okay? Polypropylene will sublimate. However, polypropylene is going to melt at high temperatures, right? So you have to um, really be careful about things like that. Subbing on, uh, let's say you're trying to sub on uh, backpacks that are have poly content in them. Um, you know, those ones, those plasticky backpacks and things like that, bags, those things are going to melt at a certain temperature. So you have to, you want to make sure that, you know, stadium chairs, things like that, you're not going to be able to use to sublimate onto mesh uh, materials, things that just cannot take high heat. Um, if it melts, you just wasted your valuable time and your money. If you take items from customers, like I don't recommend in your sublimation business that you allow any customers to provide any type of merchandise, period, at all, ever, right? Is there a delay in the video? Okay. I'm not seeing it on my end. I see y'all coming in. So I want to talk about comparing the comp comparison with other printing methods, right? Uh, comparing other printing methods to sublimation. Uh, just because I think that for those people who are new to sublimation and trying to figure out if that's what, if that's the route that they want to go, then you, you guys need to know that there are other printing methods. So, because there's definitely just not one method that fits all um, things. You know, there's popular methods out there, more durable methods than not durable, more durable than screen printing uh, on, then let me back up, not more durable than sublimating on a hundred percent polyester shirt because that's going to be a hundred percent a hundred percent permanent it's going to be embedded into the fibers it's not going to fade it's not it's just there y'all it's just there right but there are other methods the most popular method um and arguably the most one of the most durable methods of printing is still screen printing it's screen printing and the most popular method the reason i say the most popular method of screen is screen printing is because that's what you're going to see when you go to most department stores um, you're going to see screen printing because screen printing is the most affordable method of printing a shirt when you're printing in bulk doing high production now with screen printing you can also get now this is plastisol ink and it has a barely there feel which customers don't mind but you can also get you can also screen print items on t-shirts with water-based inks and have no feel okay and that's something that i think that the dye sublimate people who do dye sublimation they don't realize they always say things about oh yeah but this doesn't have any feel my customers like no feel well you can achieve that with screen printing also with screen printing you're able to print on multiple 
types of fabrics directly to multiple types of fabric you can print on cotton you can print on nylon you can print on leather you can print on polyester shirts so you're able to print on a lot of things okay you're able to print on all kinds of things mainly flat items is what you're going to be screen printing now with screen printing you're not going to want to screen print something like this you're not going to want to screen print something like this you're not going to want to screen print on hard substrates right now is it doable it is doable but most of the time when you see a cup y'all see my my little um i have a little orange cup that i drink out of that's like this and i'll show it to you guys later it has black print on it that is called pad print so another way to get items onto hard struck substrates is by using a pad printer so i want you guys to know and pad printing is very very popular it is a quick way to get a lot of things onto hard substrates it's just a printer it's boom it's like you're stamping it boom 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 and you can get those types of printers for a couple of hundred bucks you can get them autumn the ones that are automatic um may run you a thousand fifteen hundred bucks but you can really really run through some stuff right we can also sublimate on things like this 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 where we can do hundreds of these items at one time i'm going to talk about that uh in the in the uh on tuesday in the members only uh class where i'm going to talk about sublimating in bulk because some of us just like that bulk money okay let's talk about dtf and dtg DTF and DTG, both of those processes use water-based inks to print directly onto a shirt or directly onto the film. Now, the reason I've cluttered DTF and DTG and DTF together is because basically, y'all, it started out with DTG. It's the same inks. When you're using DTF inks, they are the exact same inks that people have been using forever in DT, DT g printers um the dtg printing process has been a headache it's the process where you get let's say you have a big printer and you're printing directly onto the t-shirt i think a lot of us have already seen that you're looking at those printers they may be oh 10 15 20 30 thousand dollars for a printer but you're only able to print uh, one shirt. It may take you five minutes. It may take you 10 minutes per shirt, but you're able to print full color things. DTF ended up coming into play because there was such a problem getting the DT, DTG prints to adhere and stay onto shirts. You would have to spray it with this special um, pre-treatment now Hanes has shirts that you don't have to pre-treat that you can just print on but uh, in the past and for most people the DTG printers were clogging and all of that stuff they started printing on film to printing directly to film right because the DTG machines are mainly made for printing um, cotton DTF, you're able to print on cotton, you're able to print on polyester, you're able to do a lot of things, and I'm not going to say print, but you're able to transfer that print that you've printed onto the film onto t-shirts. It's still a slow process, right? I only recommend DTF really for people who are selling transfers. Um, if you have a DTF printer, if you decide to get into the DTF printing process, it's very attractive to people who are new to the industry because you're you think oh this is a one thing fits all for t-shirts i'm able to print on dark shirts and things like that but those printers have flaws um and so there's a lot of maintenance that goes into it i'm not going to go into that but it is a very versatile process for printing on t-shirts right again every method has its issues if dtf prints are not properly they will crack and they will peel 
The same thing with screen printing. If screen printing is not cured properly, it will crack and it will peel. If it's done properly, it will outlast the life of the shirt. Okay. So those are other methods. Um, but all in all, y'all, I really recommend sublimation to those who want the ability to print on a wide variety of items and offer personalized custom custom products fast. That's the money maker in sublimation. The money maker in sublimation is you have the ability to print on so many different things. Do not limit yourself to t-shirts. I only recommend people, if you're doing sublimation, you're going to be looking at maybe 25% of your business is t-shirts. The other 75% of your business should be promotional items, right? There's a big difference between custom items and personalized items. We're going to talk about that later on and how to capitalize off of both because, um, Personalized items bring more value to your sublimation business, right? Versus let's say if I made this cup and I wanted this cup and I and I made this and it has mom on it, right? Well, I can sell a lot of these tumblers that has the word mom or has a mo mother's design on it. Um, but I'm selling it to the masses, right? It may not draw as much but I would want to sell that in volume. Now, here's personalization, right? Okay, over here, I personalized this mug. It may have a mom design on it, but it has Latana on it. The perceived value of this is going to be more because it is made for me. So there are two different markets in sublimation, and I think that a lot of people that get into sublimation um, they don't hone in and find their niche, right? And there's a lot of competition out here in sublimation, in the sublimation market. And so what happens is, and, and I'm going to tell you guys the reason why. Sublimation is fast. It's, you can do a fast turnaround. It's easy to get into. You can print on a wide variety of substrates, right? So it's very um, enticing to people who are getting into sublimation because you can really get into sublimation for about 300 bucks, right? About 300 bucks, it'll buy you a beginner's kit. You'll get, uh, you can get a printer, you can get inks and you can get your paper, just your base, you know, your basic stuff and you've got a sublimation business. So because of that, because of how easy it's gotten to get into within the past, oh, let's say seven years, it is very saturated. The competition is fierce. I'm not going to lie to y'all. The competition is fierce, but don't worry about that because we're going to explore ways to bypass your competition by creating a niche market that's going to make people flock to you and flock to your business. It's all about the way that you market your product. So I think that a lot of people get in and you're just, you get stuck with printing t-shirts. And honestly, y'all, the value of a t-shirt, the perceived the perceived value of a t-shirt nowadays is really low. It's really low. Um, even in screen printing, in, in any type of way that you print a t-shirt, the perceived value is low. When all over sublimation printing came out, we were getting 150 bucks for all over sublimation print. It went to 100 bucks. Now you can literally get an all over sublimation print for $35. Right. So the perceived value is totally, totally just kind of dropped down and um, there's more value and more profit. Sometimes when you're doing things like this, you're doing other things with sublimation. So keep that in mind. Let me take a water break. 
I know this is a lot to go through, um, but we like to get the boring stuff out of the way so that you understand sublimation before um, we go into dive into printing classes and, and all of that stuff. If you're new to sublimation, you're going to need equipment. You're going to need materials and equipment to start your sublimation business. The main piece of equipment that you're going to need is going to be the printer. You're going to need a printer. There are a couple of different types of printers that you can sublimate with. There are there is the sawgrass printers, right? Sawgrass um, printers that they have that are made for sublimation. Sawgrass partnered with Rico uh, a few uh, maybe ten years or so back and they have their own printing method right of doing dye sublimation with the sawgrass printer you're going to be pretty much stuck to using sawgrass inks you're going to be stuck to using the sawgrass software right um from last i know and this information may have changed if you do not use the sawgrass inks it's going to disable your printer not disable it but you would have some type of lines or something i can't remember they had a lawsuit going on with that i don't know what happened with that okay but just know that it with sawgrass you're going to get excellent prints um you may avoid some of the headaches of diy but you're going to be stuck using those inks that are proprietary to their machine there is also the epson printers which i'm a fan of i've always used epson printers i love epson i love epson inks um epson is in the sublimation game now so if you wanted to get a epson printer with the epson sublimation inks you could get started really quickly and easily with something like a f170 I believe those were around four hundred dollars, but you're going to be limited to about an eight and a half by fourteen inch sheet of paper. And then they have the different different uh, sublimation printers through Epson. So a lot of people don't know that. And I believe now Epson is going all the way up to the forty four inch printers, um, in dot which, which are specifically that they're specifically making for sublimation and using Epson sublimation inks. Then there are converted printers that you can convert over, like the printer here behind me. This is a Epson 7720 printer that is behind me over there in the corner is a Epson uh, 27, I believe that one is the 2720. This printer here has cartridges. So if you purchase a printer with, with uh, that you want to convert over that has cartridges i'm going to tell you guys the first thing that you want to do is you want to look and you want to see if you're able to use aftermarket cartridges this is a aftermarket cartridge right this is not a epson cartridge it is a refillable cartridge that you where you will take your sublimation inks you're going to need a quality sublimation ink something like this these are inks i do sell inks uh, also so you would take your inks and you would put your ink in here, right? And then put it into the cart. Sometimes uh, with using the refillable carts, you will come across issues where a where your printer may not recognize your cartridge, right? Um, so I would always tell you to have an extra set of cartridges available. When you're doing convert of a converted printer using the cartridges you also have to look at the fact that you're going to run out of ink so let's say i've got 200 prints to do i may end up running out of ink 200 500 i'm not sure depending on you know how many colors is in your design you may your cartridges will run out of ink um and so you're going to have to refill those cartridges which is very easy you're just going to open up the top put more ink in there reset use a chip resetter if needed or use a automatic these will automatically reset um, so it's very easy to do one of the advantages so the disadvantage of using the cartridges like i said sometimes the cartridge won't read right um normally 
it's when you're changing ink that you have that problem. You always keep an extra set of cartridges or those chips. You see that chip on the back end. You can buy these chips, this little chip here, and you can replace those chips. And if you have chips, and that's in small desktop printers or even to the 44. I'm sorry, y'all. 44 inch printers, you can buy the chips for and replace those. Now, one of the advantages of using uh, cartridges like this is that if you were to get a, a clog and Epson sublimation ink does not clog much at all. Um, most sublimation inks, if you have a quality sublimation ink, you're not really going to deal with clogs like that. Um, I can go without using the printer for a couple of weeks, but now, hey, if I'm going into a month and I crank up the printer like I did this one the other day, it may have a clog. I should be able to do a quick head cleaning and I'm back to printing. However, if you were to get a clog that you could not, um, easily remove with cleaning if you have a printer that has cartridges you can just buy an extra set of refillable cartridges put your cleaning cleaning solution into the cartridges and you have them so now when you have an issue pop those cleaning cartridges in and run a few prints right that's going to run that cleaning solution through the printer versus you doing the head cleanings right and filling up your maintenance tank so for that reason i do like these types of cartridges you can also buy what's called c s c i s s which is continuous ink systems right the continuous ink system will allow you to uh fill it up with a lot of ink right it's just like the epson echo tanks but the system is is aftermarket and it's going to sit outside of the printer so you have that option also with those printers. Now, I would tell you before you buy any type of Epson printer that you want to think you want to convert is you always want to look and see if there are, are inks available for that printer and if that printer has reset chips because some printers, you can buy a refillable chip this is where you have to be careful the newer printers because epson is not playing games anymore with us with uh with us with uh using aftermarket inks in their printers okay so the newer printers you're not going to be able to you may be able to buy a refillable cartridge right but the chip is not going to reset so that leaves you to buying a cartridge every, every a new chip every time your ink level goes down so you have to be very very careful so the newer model printers i do not i do not recommend um which one is it um uh, the newer model in this may be like the 7860 i believe that you have to do that. So I do not recommend buying the newer printers. That's why you guys see these uh, Epson printers, the older Epson printers, or uh, you may see a 7720, and that 7720 is 300, 400 bucks, and you're like, dang, why is that printer so expensive? Right, because you can still use the chips in it. With that being said, if you want to really jump into sublimation, you don't want to deal with dealing with the chips and all of that stuff, get you an EcoTank printer, right? The EcoTank, the smallest you can get into, this one is the 2700 over here. It's off camera. The 2720 here, all you're going to do is just fill those, fill that EcoTank printer up with the... Um, with this with your sublimation inks and you're ready to go okay the good thing about the eco tank printers is that epson allows you to put different inks in there so if i purchase let's say if i went and i purchased an et8500 we're not going to talk about the 2700s or the 2800s the smaller printers let's say if i went and purchased a printer that prints uh 17 inch prints because you want most of the time you want a 
larger print, right? Um, and you spend $800 on a printer, you want to be able to take it back if something happens. You don't want your warranty to be voided uh, when you purchase printers like that. Your warranty is voided. So when you look at those, when you're going in and you're searching for printers, look and see what the warranty is, right? So you... Um, you just want to go and look and see what the warranty is on these. If you need to take it back, even if you put Epson ink in it, you're still good. And you, I'm sorry, even if you put aftermarket sublimation ink in it or whatever type of ink in it, you are still good, right? To let's say the printer's damaged, you can take it back and get you another printer if that printer is under warranty. So that's something to think about. Now with the EcoTank printers, if you get a bad clog, I recommend running those printers at least weekly, right? I want to run my EcoTank printer at least weekly because you cannot put a cartridge in there with cleaning solution, right? You can't put a cartridge in there with cleaning solution. Um, and you're going to have a harder time clearing the clog, which means you're going to have to go and look at one of my videos where I'm showing you how to do the syringe and actually go in and clean the print head. But this is a very great solution. Either printer is a great solution to being able, whether it's a Sawgrass printer or an Epson printer. Either way you go, guys. The thing about sublimation printers is uh, when you're doing printing using the sublimation method, it shows up to work. It shows up to work. Sometimes your DTF printer, it doesn't show up to work. You're not able to print. These printers show up to work. Regardless of what printer you have, it's going to show up to work and it's going to print. And that's the key to making money with sublimation. When you have a printer, you want it to print just as if you're printing office paper. Boom, 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 boom. And you can come in and you can print four or five hundred pieces of four or five hundred designs a day, you know, and even more because you're just running it like a regular office printer. If you have a printer, anytime you invest in a printer and that printer is not working, it's not the solution for you. Thus, I'm going to veer off and tell you guys about, like, for example, with me, with using the Eco, uh, the Eco Solvent printer. Converting this printer, I put Eco Solvent ink in the printers, used it, it worked for me for a while, and then I found that, okay, I'm not running that printer every day, right? When you don't run that printer every day, it clogs. When you don't shake up those pigment inks, those, um, uh, because the, um, water-based Eco Solvent inks, they have pigment. That pigment pigment will start to separate, right? When it starts to separate, it becomes a problem, especially when it's in the eco tank printers. You have to shake that printer up. We don't have to shake up our sublimation ink, so you're not going to have those types of problems. You're not going to have any issues with smell with sublimation printers, right? Okay, so let's jump into the equipment. So we've talked about the printers. Let's talk about sublimation ink. You need to use, when you are using, deciding what type of sublimation ink that you're going to go with and you are new to sublimation. Most of the time, most people are going to stick to the ink that they originally put in the printer. So, for example, if I buy Epson sublimation ink, if that's who I'm using, I'm going to want to always use the Epson sublimation ink because what happens is, let's say we got the Lady Print Boss inks and then we have some Epson sublimation ink. We put the Epson sublimation ink in there and then we run out of the Epson sublimation ink. I'll use the same color bottles. And then we say, okay, we want to put, I, I found, this bottle and this ink is cheaper than this ink, and I'm going to put this ink in there, right? What happens is these two formulas may not be the same. These two formulas may not be the same. So what happens now is you mix, even though you're using magenta and magenta, you mix that magenta in, and now your colors are off. 
and you're coming out with those muddy colors. So you don't want to do that. If you decide that you're going to switch inks, you have to go in and clean out the printer, right? You want to go in and remove, purge those inks. So it's going to be very um, important that you start out using a ink that is highly recommended that has um, a lot of good reviews. Now, just about every YouTuber, uh, Facebook group, things like that, people have now started selling their own sublimation inks, even me, right? But I know I have a quality ink. And I know that I can support people who are purchasing my inks, right? So if you, because I know the ink settings. So if you go out and you buy an ink from someone, that's not a big company you want to make sure are they able to support you when you have problems are they able to tell you uh what settings to use with different papers right things like that so you want to be careful so i always recommend either use a major brand or if you're going to use a smaller company then make sure that you do your research on inks because sometimes your problem is your ink all ink does not fit with different papers. Like, for example, you have the, um, what brand here? What brand here? Let me see. We've got something down here. Where is it? I think it's the Koala inks and paper. You will have Koala inks and you'll have Koala paper. Those the ink and the paper is formulated for each other, right? You have, so let's say that I'm using a, um, a sub paper, right? And I'm using a different ink. I don't know. Um, let's say the ink is called Stars ink, right? That ink may not be formulated for that paper which is fine, you'll have to go in and set, change your settings and figure out what works best, right? The quality of paper matters. Just like the quality of ink matters, the quality of paper matters. Can you sublimate on plain copy paper? Yes, you can. Are you going to have as vibrant of a print as you would have if you were using a 125 gram sublimation paper? No, you're not, right? Um, so the quality of the paper matters. You have 125 grams, you have 120 grams in paper, right? So you have certain papers that have, um, that are sticky sublimation papers. Those papers work good on shirts to keep your polyester shirts from ghosting. You're going to put it there. You don't have to use heat tape with it. So paper matters. You want to make sure that you're using a high quality paper. Me, myself, I use Asa paper. I have also successfully been able to uh, sublimate on things like uh, hammer mill matte paper, right? But am I going to get as high of a quality as I can get when I'm sublimating on paper that is thicker, that is made for sublimation, right? No, it's not going to happen. And you have to look at that when you're in the reason I'm saying this is because we've all done it. Right. But you have to look at it when you're looking at competition. I told y'all that the market is fierce. The market is fierce. So if I'm using regular paper and I'm doing and I have, let's say I have this cool. OK, what do we have coming up? We have Father's Day coming up or let's say pride, gay pride. I have a gay pride design that I went and I pulled off of something like a Creative Fabrica or one of these websites, right? I'm using that design. It's okay. I got a design for y'all. The Messy Bond Mama. Okay. I'm so tired of seeing her. I don't know what to do with the Messy Bond. The Messy Bond has been out for oh, how many years now? Maybe four four or five years we've been seeing this messy bun um and you can find the messy bun in all kinds of designs so you do this tumbler and you have the messy bun design on here you have your ink your sublimation that you've done with regular paper right 
and then I have my sublimation print over here with the same design because I we pulled it off the same website and we sell in the same design and we going neck and neck on Etsy. My photos are looking a whole lot crisper and a whole lot clearer than your photos, right? Because my cup is nice and vibrant and yours is not. You may be selling your tumbler at let's say 20 bucks and I be maybe selling my tumbler over here at 25 bucks people are going to look and say okay whose tumbler am I going to buy right so you want to keep that type of stuff in mind you always want that quality when you are it's just like with me when I'm screen printing y'all see that bright white honey Okay, I want quality. I don't want, I'm not going to jump on here with a shirt that's cracking and peeling. People are not going to buy. So you want to make sure that you're using when you're, now when you're testing, when you're testing your printer, you can use stuff like that. But when you are using, the higher the quality product that you're using, right, the higher quality your end product is going to be. So the higher quality that your supplies are, I should say your supplies, high quality inks, high quality supplies, equal high quality product, okay? Um, so I hope that helps. Sublimation HTV. Everybody wants to know about printing on these dark shirts, right? And a lot of times, here we go. Y'all going to be mad at me because I'm going to bring it, okay? Here we go. Y'all going to be mad at me because I'm going to bring it, okay? Um, Printing on dark shirts. There are all types of substrates out there that you can buy, all types of materials that you can buy to try to hack your way through, right? Now, there are products that are made specifically to print to do that will take your sublimation inks and print onto your dark shirts I would recommend using a high quality product um, and I'm not going to call any names of companies but there are some products that are out there by brand name companies that are inferior uh, products and so they don't take ink well if you are going to use those products, you need to make sure that you look and you find the right, the correct settings, you know, and just know that when you're using, let's say if I'm using a printable vinyl to get that white on a shirt or to, because I want to print on a cotton shirt, it's not direct sublimation, right? A lot of times when your customers call you and they ask for sublimation, they're looking, they may be looking for that no field sublimation, right? Um, so you need to be able to explain that to your customers that, hey, this is not direct sublimation. Um, this is what we can do, right? Because if I'm looking for dye sublimation, I'm looking and I call it by name, right? If I call it by name, when my customers call me and they call dye sublimation by name, it's either one, I've been doing some research and this is just what I think I want, or I actually know what I want. Right. And so if I call you and I say, hey, I, I'm having a golf tournament and I want to order some dye sublimation shirts and blah, blah, blah. And then you turn around and you use cotton shirts and you put a um, a printable vinyl on top of that shirt and I get it and I'm looking for that no feel, I'm going to be upset. So you want to make sure that whatever it is that you're doing, that your customer knows your process right um, and if a customer asks you they say yeah we want to get some dye sublimation shirts but we want to want the shirts to be black you stop them right and then that's where you tell them okay so if I do true sublimation I can't do that on a black shirt and maybe you direct them to another process or if sublimation is the only process that you use then at that point, you will direct them and let them know that this is what we can do. We can do indirect sublimation, right? So you always make sure that that's clear before you deal with customers. Same thing goes for sublimatable materials like 
um like heat transfer vinyl right not all so all heat transfer vinyl you can't sublimate on your regular heat transfer vinyl and think that it's going to sublimate flock let's talk about flock people will try to sublimate on flock you're going to get more of a dull look you're not going to be able to sublimate everything with glitter like if i'm doing for example if i'm doing a um a dance team right i may be able to sublimate the glitter because it fits for that genre or it fits for that niche let me show you guys something really quick oh, oh my leg if I find it. No, that's not in here. Okay. So I thought that this shirt was in here, but it's not. But I do have one for y'all to show y'all. So a lot of my stuff is no longer here in the room. But um you can purchase uh, you can sublimate on glitter and maybe I'll find that shirt throughout the class and show you guys the difference of what sublimating on glitter looks like versus what you would do if you were printing that garment directly with glitter, like a, H, a glitter HTV, right? Um, the only time that I would ever recommend sublimating on glitter is if, like I say, hey, you're doing like a cheer team or something like that, and they're asking for glitter. You don't want to sublimate any type of corporate logos onto glitter or anything like that, because, and especially if you have men wearing the shirts, who's going to, you know, you're just not going to get as vibrant of a look. White glitter is going to be the one that's going to give you the most vibrant look, but again, the glitter sometimes distorts the image like the it, it, it's just you know it just distorts the image so you have to be really careful with what type of prints you're doing i pulled this shirt out um that i want to show y'all it's 1209 we got about 15 more minutes of this um this shirt is a 52 percent cotton and 46 percent polyester i had a customer who wanted this shirt sublimated, right? They wanted sublimation on this shirt. And so what I did, this shirt has been washed several times. So what I did, remember when I told y'all, I said, hey, actually do some prints so that you can show your customers what those shirts look like. This is a RGB color palette, right? Let me kind of pull back doesn't look as bad as it's coming across on camera. This is an RGB color palette. This is on a Canva Bellis 50% uh, cotton, 46% polyester. There's more cotton in this shirt than polyester. You're going to get a really, 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 really vintage look on this, right? So what I do, if I have, and this is just for you to show customers so that they know what they're getting before they get it so that you're meeting their expectations. Because my customer is not expecting for this uh, black to look bright. They're not expecting for the black to look bright. So if you show them, right? If you show them to, if you show them specifically what it looks like when you print out your RGB color palette. You can do this on your polyester shirts, like you get a white polyester shirt, and you print out this RGB color palette. That lets you know when you're printing designs what that color is going to look like on that shirt. Even if, like how I say yellow, if you have a yellow sublimation shirt, do that, right? And when you do that, and you print it out it's going to show you what those colors are going to turn to and you can use that for reference if you're doing like a light pink or whatever it just uses you can use that stuff for reference for two things for you to see what the color is going to look like also for you to see how that content is going to look now if you decide to print that 
let's say you do a shirt like this and you decide to print it and it has it doesn't have a hundred percent polyester you want to wash it you want to wash it and then you're showing the wash shirt after you've laundered that shirt you want to show it to your customers that's the shirt that you're going to have in your showroom or that you're going to have in your little arsenal that you're going to show to your customers right because that way you're going to get the true color of what it's going to be like and you're going to know when my customers watch this this is what it's going to look like and then you decide if you want to put this out or you let your customers decide if that's what they want right you let them decide if they want that vintage look like that so it's really really this is a good this is a good tool for you to use um i honestly don't use so i rarely the only time that i use sublimation on shirts is if i'm pretty much doing polyester shirts um and that's because i do have other methods of printing that i can use um most of the time for me my sublimation is going to be on hard substrates y'all okay okay the heat press Let's talk about heat presses. You're going to need a heat press. You're going to need a heat press to sublimate, to, to produce sublimate, sublimation items. Now, you have cheaper heat presses. You can get a $150 heat press. You can get a $2,500 heat press, right? You can get heat presses that have bottom heat flattens, top heat flattens. There's tons of different heat presses out there that you can use. With sublimation, you don't, necessarily need a heat press that has a lot of firm pressure you can use medium pressure the key with sublimation is you don't want a heat press that has cold spots now i have successfully printed hundreds of shirts on a fancier press on a 150 dollars fancier press off of amazon okay i have also successfully printed thousands of shirts with a geo night heat press that you know and i did not have with either press i did not have cold spots but some heat presses do have cold spots a cold spot you'll know if you have a cold spot in your heat press because it will be places that will not um sub really good like you'll see like a this color is a dark purple let's say you're doing purple on a white shirt you'll see this area is dark purple and then you see this area here is kind of a lighter purple you'll start to notice that you have cold spots so you want to try to get you know try to avoid those things you want to try to get a quality press now for me if i'm doing uh sub if i'm doing sublimation i'm never going to recommend i'm going to tell y'all i'm never going to recommend any heat press under a 15 by 15 right i'm never gonna recommend a heat press under a 15 by 15. i'm definitely not gonna do like a 9 by 9 or a 10 by 10 or anything like that um the average size of a print now we can go here this is a piece of paper so if i have just a standard letter size printer this is how big of a print i can do from here this is i am a big girl right so this is a standard size print notice where that print is on that paper same as this screen print this is how big i'm able to print now with this i would be able to come here okay sometimes people people most people's designs are in let's say if it's it's in a square versus being in a rectangle right we're not talking about printing square but just the circumference of the design if you're doing a circle here right with an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet it's going to be a lot smaller but if we had 11 by 11 or 11 by 17 inch sheet then that circle could come out to be 10 10 inches so what happens is when we're designing if that what people do is they'll take two sheets of paper if they only have a letter size printer and and you can mirror that together right it is uh, a craft to be able to do that a lot of times you will have that line so you that's something that i'm not going to be doing here on the channel today 
uh, in my pressing, what I prefer to do is just purchase uh, the a bigger printer that's going to print 11 by 17. So I have this in one sheet, right? You can, like for example, my R13, it has roll feed options. So I can do a roller, a um, roll of sublimation paper. And I think I have a roll here somewhere. Is that it? No, nope, no, nope, that's not it. But, oh, there it is. Kind of. So this is a roll of sublimation paper. If you find yourself doing a lot of shirts, like you think, hey, I'm going to be doing a lot of shirts. And I'm really serious about this. You can get a printer that accepts the roll feed option. The which would be I would go into Epson. Uh, what what is the 24 inch Epson printer? I would go into the 24 inch Epson sublimation printer and I will be able to print this roll. This printer right here, I can put longer pieces of paper in there but it's I, it's not going to stop and cut or anything like that, right? Um, it's going to just keep rolling, going, going, even at the end of the thing. But this one over here, I can put this in, set it to print. Let's say I want to do uh, 24 feet. I can set it, and then I've got a larger piece, a larger piece, a larger design that's in one piece for me to print with. Y'all may have seen me do a video on how to do an all-over print with sublimation with a smaller printer, right? I did that video because I do videos like that just to show people. But in my personal business, I'm not going to do it. It takes too long. It slows me down. Money is time and time is money, okay? So um, there are different things you can do to speed up. Like if you're doing a lot of sublimation, something like this, a printer that does the roll printing would be great. Um, even in your papers, there are you want to make sure that if you do the roll paper, you get a paper that is specifically for sublimation. This one came off of Amazon and it is garbage. Okay, Lexmark sells some really, really good sublimation paper. Uh, that's sticky paper that you can buy in the rolls and also, um, I believe that Epson has their own paper also now. So there we go. Um, so you got the heat press. You want to get, you know, a decent heat press. You can start off, like I said, you can start off with a $50, $150 heat press off of Amazon. See how it works for you. I wouldn't do anything under a 15 by 15. A 15 by 15 is going to cover mostly anything that you do. So if you have... 11 by 17 inch design even though you're not able to fit that whole design on there and press it all at one time believe in pressing i want to try to press all of my sublimation items at one time and not do two presses you can't move it and do two presses you're risking that your design up here is going to be nice and vibrant and then you're going to do the second press and you may start to see some ghosting. You may start to see some browning where this design here that you pressed again second because you resublimated part of that. Now that design is starting to dull out. So you may have some issues. But if you can do a 15 by 15 inch print, a 15 by 15 inch uh, press is going to do most things. And honestly, who needs that big of a print? You know what I'm saying? 15 by 15, you are going to be good. You want to step it up a notch get you a 16 by 20 inch press um, the clamshells now have most of the new ones have the pull out drawers i actually sold my clamshell because those clamshell presses honey they be up in your face especially when you're wearing glasses and glasses fogging up and all that kind of stuff and that heat is hitting your face so i am a fan of swingaways and presses that pull out pull out drawers things like that um so that's that the other thing you may need when you are sublimating if you're sublimating onto flat items you're going to sublimate on the heat press right you want a heat press that's going to be able to sublimate on things that are two inches sometimes when you have the clamshells because they come down like this right you may have see how my hand is you may have uneven pressure uh printing big items like for example if we wanted to do if i wanted to sublimate on this slate i may have a problem using a press 
that comes like this because as you see when I put that in my hand it's if I close my hand here you see that the pressure is not even my hands are not flat to each other right the pressure is not an even so not even so when you're doing stuff like this you can break it so in that case you would want to use a swing away um, either a swing away press or a press that just closes like this right so you just got to know your different presses and what it is that you're able to press um, if I'm doing things like this, cups, mugs, tumblers, I'm not a fan of the heat presses that have like the five-in-ones and all of that. Y'all, those things are on the cheaper presses, on the cheaper presses. I'm not a fan of those because the cheaper presses, you got to look at, hey, I'm, I'm spending 200 bucks on a press and I'm getting like five different things. You're constantly changing stuff in and out. What happens is things start to break. Honestly, they start to break. The press is cheap to start with. So I am a fan of having a heat press to press your flat items, having a either have you a tumbler press or a mug press to press your, to press your tumblers or mugs. I'm not a fan of, um, I don't want to, if I'm doing this tumbler, I really don't want to have to, I want a tumbler press. I want it to do sublimate everything at one time. I like for everything to be sublimate at one time. Again, this comes back to quality control. I know I'm stressing it, but it comes back to quality control. Um, I don't want this part to be sublimated and then this part of the sublimation to fade. I just don't want it. I don't want any lines or anything like that. Can you do it? People do it. They hack their way through. Um, but if you're able to purchase something that you're able to do multiple things with. Um, so if I have a tumbler press, I can do my tumblers in the tumbler press. I can also do my mugs in the tumbler tumbler press versus me having just a mug press a separate mug press and I have to put this in here and then turn it around y'all get what I'm saying so hopefully that stuff makes sense I don't use so my tumb my press my mug press I actually sold it when I moved into this house and sold the clamshell press so I don't have one so Mel is going to come on and she is great at doing that type of stuff she's going to come on at two o'clock and from two to three we're going to be working on mugs and tumblers stepping that game up so y'all make sure that y'all come in at that time when she's on doing that because I think you will really learn some valuable things. She'll give you a great demonstration on that. And then she'll talk about some of her experiences uh, doing, you know, printing on tumblers and things like that. I like to use a convection oven. That's what I use when I am using my uh, pressing. Now, they do have sublimation ovens. There's a kind of a difference in a sublimation oven and a regular convection oven, like a Black & Decker convection oven, right? That you can use to sublimate in. And then now they have sublimation items that are for sublimation. If you are going to use a convection oven, I would tell you to purchase a good one with a timer on it so that you know the temperature or you can get the little thermostat that you put on the inside of the of the um, convection oven. What the convection oven does, depending on the size of it, it allows you to print more items at one time. So let's say, for example, if I need to put three tumblers in there, I'm able to do three tumblers at one time versus doing one tumbler. Now. I use, I have a, um, a Gen Air oven, which is a real oven um, that you cook in. And that's what I did my sublimation in. Now, and the reason I had that in my house is because I was doing bulk items, right? So I was using a convection, a, a, 
an oven that has the convection capabilities to do bulk items because I could literally put 25 mugs in the oven on a tray, put about 20 down at the bottom, and I'm able to do, oh, let's say 50 mugs at one time, right, in the oven. That oven was specifically for doing my sublimation, not an oven that I cooked in. Right. So I had that oven and then I had my oven built in the wall that I would cook in. So there are some ways for you to do bulk sublimation. You can also if you have a conveyor dryer um, and. Um, uh, Nicole brought this up to me, Nicole from A to Z Crafty Shop brought this up to me last night about um, the sublimation about my oven, about my conveyor dryer. Whereas I was in there and I was telling her, hey girl, I can't, I'm not gonna be able to sublimate tomorrow. So they do have on tumblers. I'm not gonna be able to do my sublimation tumblers uh, because my convection oven is at the other house and I do have a small convection oven, which Ken said he was going to get y'all, but I, he hasn't showed back up with it. so. I don't know if it's coming or not, but if it does, I'm going to do a demonstration. So I was able to, long story short, is I started thinking about if I would be able to sublimate in the conveyor dryer. Now the conveyor dryer gets really, really hot. Um, it's not something that I would recommend right now, but they do have conveyor dryers that are about six feet long with chambers for you to do that with the conveyor belt. I did put this item into my dryer. Let me pull it back some. I did put this item into my dryer and I was able to sublimate on it. However, because it was my first time and I don't know the temperatures, it has a yellow tint to it. But if I'm able to perfect it, and I reached out to the manufacturer. I don't know if you can tell, but this one is white. It has not been sublimated. Oh, no, this one is white and has not been sublimated. This one was sublimated in the convection, in the uh, conveyor dryer that I do my t-shirts with. It looks like a big pizza oven. This is if you're wanting to do like bulk. This was successful, but it's a little bit yellow. So it stayed in there a little bit too long. Um, where are the tumblers? I burnt up some stuff basically last night. I did put a tumbler in the oven and turn the belt all the way down and I burnt that cup up. Okay. It did start to sublimate. Now back here, the cup started to sublimate. Um, I have never done this before, but when I looked at the conveyor dryer online, I saw that, hey, you can do it. So I'm waiting for the uh, distributor to reach back out to me to give me some guidance in uh, getting it done. But had it became out pretty good, and there's that line back there, uh, had it came out, it would have... You know, so I'll let y'all know about that as I going as I uh, think about. It, okay, I will let y'all know about that as time goes by, and after I talk to the distributors and find out uh, what's the correct temperature and dwell time in the big oven, because I always use the other oven, but it would be great for me to be able to do, you know, knock off a hundred items. Uh, that way. Other thing that you're going to need is going to be your sublimation blanks, heat transfer tape. You may need an adhesive spray. I recommend buying the, if you want to do, if you want your paper to be tacky and you don't want to use tape, just buy the sublimation, the tacky sublimation paper. If not, you can use an adhesive spray. Um, Nicole's been really successful with using adhesive spray on her end. I've used the 3M uh, adhesive spray. Um, sometimes with adhesive spray, though, y'all, 
if you spray it and you get too much of a mist, you know how like because you're spraying adhesive and you get a clump and it hits onto your paper, then it will permeate onto the item that you're doing and then you will have a spot. So if you see that, then stop. Okay. Um, you may need wraps for your mugs and wraps for your tumblers. Okay. Um, what do you call it? Um, somebody put in the chat the um, you have the silicone wraps and then you have the the wraps that um, shrink wrap. You have the shrink wraps. So you have you may need those for your tumblers. Okay. I would recommend using it for your tumblers. You can also, you know, some people will type We'll put the design on there and then tape it. You know, we'll see how Mel does it. Um, it's up to, you know, up to you. But again, you know, we're all going back into quality. Heat resistant gloves and scissors. Those are the things that you're going to need. Um, you may need some type of pressing pad uh, for, let me see if I have one. It is a special pad for when you're pressing things like this, which will conduct the heat, um, which transfers the heat here, right? So you may need that special pad. I use a, um, I use, what I use is a, it's like a silicone baking sheet is what I use to lay over mine. And you may need like a towel to put under the bottom of stuff like this. Hopefully we will, I will do this one today. I will try to do that one today. Um, oh, you're going to need a lint roller for your sublimation because any type of dirt or fibers when you're sublimating that's on the shirt, it'll turn like a bluish purplish looking color. So you want a lint roll. Uh, brown craft paper. Um, you can even use burlap, like a piece of burlap on top of your press. It will stop the sublimation process. Um, and that's going to lead us into designing for sublimation. I'm going to stop here um, and take a few look over into the comments, see what y'all are talking about. Then we're going to talk about like designing for sublimation, color management, uh, and color profiles, and choosing the right image and graphics. And then we're going to break. So we're going to break at 1 p.m. and then the magic will start to happen. Um, Mel will come on at 2 p.m. and she will do the cups. I will come on behind her and I will do some demonstrations with t-shirts and other substrates and uh, we will talk about troubleshooting common problems that you have when you are sublimating it could be issues with printing and your transfer paper it could be problems with your color and image quality and we're going to talk about preventive maintenance and care of your equipment i think we've already pretty much covered that but from here forward after um, this video is when we are going to then start diving into printing. So um, I'm going to put up another thumbnail for her to come on at 2 p.m. Let's see what we are talking about. Uh, Tampa just added in one um, alcohol wipes or alcohol. Um, I use 90% alcohol if I'm going to wipe down my goods. Um, let's see here. Let me go in and see what information my boss members are adding to the conversation. If you have any questions, this is the time to put it in here because at 1 p.m. I am going to get off.
Okay, T. Lamont, that is a good, good, that, that's good right there. Uh, T. Lamont says, we need the best and affordable substrate for dark t-shirts so that we don't have to order DTF um, and we can keep, and we can keep all the money. Keep, oh, he trying to keep all the money in his pocket. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. We'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about that. A little bit later on in the show I may do I will do a I will do a printable vinyl that's made specifically for sublimation on a black shirt so I'm not going to say hello to anyone individually because I kind of spoke to y'all as y'all came in. Um, unless there's like a question and I go through. Um, Tampa says that she had to buy uh, activation keys with her WF printer. I believe that uh, Teresa is talking about the newer workforce printers that require the chips. Um, the uh, maintenance boxes, y'all. I'm going to tell y'all something about the uh, about your printers. Another thing about Epson printers: at some point in time, your Epson printer may get an end of life message because Epson will only allow you to use these printers for so long, and then they give you the end of life message. Um, Go back to older videos. I have videos going back 10 years where you can just go in and just reset that stuff. Um, there is a, and the reason they do it is because the ink pads, uh, after so long, the ink pads kind of fill up. There are some ways that you can go in and, you know, you're either going to, you're going to clean the maintenance tanks. There are things that you can read, uh, not the maintenance tanks. Yeah, the maintenance tank. Uh, depending on the type of printer that you have. So you can refill that. Do uh, You can purchase reset keys. Those reset keys are, I believe, at twomanuals.com. You can get those for about 10 bucks. Um, twomanuals.com also has a WIC utility software. And what the WIC utility software does is that software allows you. I didn't realize that I was so far from the microphone. Hopefully, y'all have been able to hear me without any problems that WIC uh, reset, what it allows you to do is when you plug in a printer, it allows you to see how many how many uh, prints have been printed, what's the life of the printer, how many prints have been printed during the life of the printer, what's the life of the maintenance tank, things like that. Um, and it also allows you to reset certain things in the in your uh, printer so let's say for example if you do not have like these automatically reset right let's say if you have uh some cartridges that don't reset now i believe in buying reset chips and you pay 20 30 dollars for a reset chip and you're done this is on older printers but if you don't have that you can go there and they'll charge you to reset it right um you're going to be spending a lot of money constantly paying for resets Stay here. Um, T. Lamont, say it again. Men don't like glitter vinyl on their products. Say it again. Um, there are some times when like we can use rhinestones and glitter things, um, not really glitter, uh, but there are some uses, right, for different things. But um, yeah, men don't, men, it's really not something that men um, have, ta have taken a liking to or that you're going to really push on to them.
I'm just looking here. Okay, y'all. But no, you're not going to have any problems with that maintenance box. You're going to pop it out and you're going to change it and you're going to put it back in. And put another one back in. Okay, we may, I don't, I believe that Mel is going to also, when she comes on, y'all, I think she's going to do some glass substrates um, also. Um, I'm not really sure what all the ladies are going to do. So I don't see any questions here. I don't really see any any uh, questions here. So we're going to go ahead and I'm going to talk about um, designing for dye sublimation, right? And this is going to be really quick. I am not going to do any designing today, right? I'm not going to create any designs today. What we're going to talk about is designing for dye sublimation, software and tools for designing. When you are, if you're, so there's a couple of different ways that you can approach it, right? You can buy items. Um, you can buy photos. We're going to say JPEGs, PNGs. You can buy things that are ready, uh, that are already ready. Tons of designs out here on the internet that are already ready for you to purchase and to be able to template it. They're templates, they're ready to go, and you can purchase those. Um, when you're purchasing things or when you are finding images, you want to make sure that you're using a high quality image, y'all. You don't want an image that's pixelated. Um, let's say if we're doing, we're printing on the average size of a paper, right? Let's say we're gonna do this tumbler. And this tumbler is going to be about eight inches. It's going to use, if you look at it, it's going to use the majority of this sheet of paper, which means that our image size should be at least 300 DPI. I'm going to fold this paper. So our image size would need to be about an eight and a half by, I'm going to say 10. Let's say it's going to be about an eight and a half by 10 inch square. That's 300 DPI, not a square not a design this size that's 300 dpi right so what a lot of people do is they find small images and then when you start to blow that image up to the size that you want to print on it gets pixelated right pixelated is basically when your i when your design gets really blurry right i do recommend Unless you're doing like a photograph, I do recommend that you use, if you're going to be creating uh, uh, sublimation artwork and things like that, I do recommend that you're going to use, you're going to either have a professional program where you're going to be able to produce high quality images. Um, that would be for photos. Let's say for photograph for photos, you're going to use something like um, Photoshop, uh, something like um, Corel Photo Paint. Uh, those are going to give you high quality images, right? But your images, you don't want them to be any less than 300 DPI, right? When you bring in your images into a professional software, you may be able to go in, you have the options, not maybe, but you have the options to play with colors. You have the options to do color adjustments. You can use the auto color adjustment, and then you can go in and you can play with the colors there that you're using um, in your software. The other thing about software is I'm going to tell you if you are creating your own designs, I, also, I totally recommend using vector art, right? Unless it's a photograph. If you're using vector art, no matter how big, for example, this word boring right here, if it's vector art, no matter how big this design is, this would be an example of vector art. No matter how big I increase this design to, it's still going to be considered lines. 
and you're never going to get any type of problems where you're going to have any type of pixelations or resolution problems that comes over in your design to where when you print something now you have that blurry image or you're not getting those colors that pop right a lot of times you're sublimating and you're like wow why is that not popping right the other thing y'all is i want y'all to remember that when you're printing and you're looking at an image on your computer right if your computer screen is not calibrated right you may not get a true red or a true blue or the true image that you're looking for if your image if your screen brightness is turned up to a hundred percent right you may get a your reds may look kind of pinkish on screen right so you want to have right there at that 50 percent what i like to do is i always if somebody sends me a photo right i'm gonna print that photo out in the size of the print on regular paper in the size of the print that i'm going to do right i can print that out in the size of the print that i'm going to print and that way i can look at it and i can physically see if this artwork is good or not but you want to use high quality uh, image software, um, high quality editing software, so that you're able to get a higher end product, right? Or you want to use high quality images when you're printing. Um, the other thing about software, professional software, is that when you're using professional software, you're able to use color management tools and you're able to change color printing profiles also you're able to change color printing file profiles in some of the epson printers like you can switch it you can use like i have an epson 9890 color profile i can um, switch that color profile and use it with my 2720 i can also go in and i can add the ink let's say if i purchase the ink and that ink comes with a color profile, I can upload that color profile into my design software. Now I have the exact color profile that Mac that was made for that ink. And hopefully that makes sense. So now my reds are actually going to be red and they're not going to be burgundy or they're not going to be mauve. So you look for inks when you're printing that's the other thing when you're buying inks, right? If you have a Epson printer, buy inks that are already color profiled for F for the printer that you're using, if you can, right? Um, I'm Teresa, I'm not going to talk about calibrating the screen today because that's more into the design aspect. Uh, but when you calibrate your screen, if you go into your into your uh uh, PC settings you'll see calibration I'll do that for you in another video where I talk where I show you how to calibrate your screen also y'all your monitor really matters like I have I have uh, a couple of different monitors I have one monitor that is made specifically for designing right when you go in and you change you can on some monitors you can change your color settings for whether you're doing office work, whether you're doing graphic designing, things like that. And then that way you get a truer color of what it is that you're printing. In Corel Draw, you can proof colors before you print them. So, or you can print colors as they are on screen. Proof colors really helps with your design process, right? Now, in all honesty, most items that you're printing, you're not going to have to color profile if you're using a good ink if you're using a high quality image you're not going to have to do a lot of color profiling but i showed you guys in my last sublimation video where we were talking about um going the difference in printing from your phone and not having all of those options or printing from just you know how you just go in and you print from windows photo and you don't have those options i showed you guys the difference when you print from things like that where you don't have those color options right to go in and change there's a lot of things that you can do within your epson printer settings or within whatever printer settings that you have to be able to change those color profiles um 
that that you're using so i will go in there really quick but it's just all about using the right the right images and the right graphics because i'm working on these screens i'm not able to show that um i'm not able to show you how to get into the calibration right now but what i will do is i will really really quickly go into corral and i'm just going to go in here um turn that camera off and let's just jump over here into Corel draw really really quickly and I'm here where color profiles are going to be up in here color management I've already did a video on that if y'all want to dive deep into that we can definitely dive deep into that but we're going to just go in for this sake of this video because most people may not have a professional um, program we're going to look at this image. This is the image that I did last night. This is vector art. This is the image right here, right? So let's say, for example, I hit this image. I can go here. This image is 300 DPI. So it prints really, really neat and clean. If the image was small in Corel, it has the ability to change the DPI. However, it's only going to be able to do so much right to the image um, if the image is a low quality image. Now, when we go over here in most programs, let's just we're just talking about using the standard printer settings. Okay, here we are. I'm I'm gonna use the I'll just use this one because this one is the one that's up, right? So in here we can go in and we can use color conversions, and I can use the color conversions from the Epson printer or from the program Corel Draw. I'm going to just use it from the printer because we're talking about printers, but within the printers here, this is a standard RGB color profile. For some reason, it's not let me click. Must be there. We go. So within here, here's a standard color profile. You see, I have color profiles for all of my printers that I'm using. So you can. This is where I'm talking about. You can upload certain color profiles that will go for your inks, like that's compatible with your ink. So if you had a particular color profile you would upload that color profile and it would be in here so every time you went to print you would print let's say from latana's ink latana's ink color profile you go in here okay there's the color profile for this particular ink and i'm going to print from it you can switch and print from apple rgb if you want you notice that made my uh colors a little bit more saturated so there are a lot of different things that you can do i can put on proof color settings right that's going to proof these colors and say okay we're going to print from exactly what it is um this in here i'm not going to really get into because this deals pretty much with uh the rendering intent over in uh corel um but i'll dive into that in another video right i will dive into that in another video um so when you are i see someone saying hey i don't have those options this print menu is the print menu from corel draw right um which is a professional graphics program when you go into your print menu if you're just using the computer's print menu this is what you're going to see right this is what most of you are going to see you're going to see this and you're going to have these options here depending on your printer and i did not cover this when we were talking about printers printers have different print resolutions they print uh depending on the print head they print different size picoliters i've talked about picoliters in other videos Picoliters are the size of the drop that the printers will print. So you may have a Epson 2700 and you may have a higher quality Epson, let's say an 800 
dollar Epson printer by Epson a photo printer and that photo printer it, even though they're both printers Epson printers that photo printer the quality of the print is going to be affected because the quality of that print that printer is made to print photographic images so you're gonna have a nice vibrant image that you may not be able to get with a workforce printer because a workforce printer is not made specifically to print photographs. So I hope that that makes a lot of sense when you are looking at uh, what printers to buy, right? Um, so here in here, you will have normally you're going to use the presentation mat, right? Uh, printer. Um, sometimes you may use high quality print paper high quality print paper prints really well this prints just fine for me um, I've done a video on settings and once I find the settings that I like I save them so for example this is my settings for my sublimation paper I'm using premium presentation mat and I'm using standard quality now normally I may if I'm doing a bunch of shirts and I do a test print, I may use this um, high quality plain paper. I may use this settings, right? Um, and it will print just fine. I'm not using this setting because I have a little clog in that regular plain paper head. I showed in another video where when you do your print head check, you'll have two different two different sets on uh, depending on the printer you're using and on this printer I have a nozzle check for plain paper settings and a nozzle check for the premium paper settings right so that's just a little tidbit of information there you can go into I would always turn off high speed printing when I am printing in my print settings. I don't want us to speed through. I don't want that paper coming out wet. I don't want I don't want any kind of rolling marks. I don't want anything like that. I want to slow it down and just print print, right? Because I want quality prints. You can go into here and you can go into advanced into color issues. Now I would do custom because it's set on automatic. If you want to, if you're finding that you're having problems and you don't have a professional graphics program, right? You can go over here and you can go into advanced and then you can play around with these settings on your on your printer. These are the settings that's going to come with your with any Epson printer, right? You can go in and go into advanced color management and figure out how to fix that. You have here where it's like fixed photo, auto correct, right? Whether you're printing people, different things like that. That's why I say you have to do um the work to find what printer works for you best, right? You can use your ICM color profiles. You can also set it to no color adjustments here I'm using a, a Epson vivid color mode you may find that RGB works better for you and for your inks use the color mode that works with your inks right um, I would always recommend that when you purchase inks from a manufacturer you find out that information what is it and if they don't provide it you may not need, need to be purchasing it for from them right so here you see we can up uh, our brightness and contrast and all of that type of stuff and then you've got the original and you've got you know where you can preview the image so you know hey if that's something that you want to do I don't have any issues with my lady print boss inks so I'm going to stay right over here in my standard stuff but I do turn off this high um the high speed because um depending on your printer right depending on your printer sometimes your inks will come out a little wet um so turn off that high speed and that's going to just slow it down make sure that you don't have any um not lines but um any like streaks or anything like that in in your you know in your prints so I hope that that helps if y'all want to dive deeper into color management um, I may come back at the end tonight and we can and we can go into that 
right? Um, so that, let's see, was there anything else that I had on here about that, right? So we talked about choosing the right images and all of that stuff, right? Um, I'm not going to go into this right now. We're going to go ahead and break because it is 1 p.m. And mail is going to come on at 2 p.m. So I'm going to go in and this is part one. This will be labeled part one. You guys will be able to go back in and replay this. Mail is going to come on at 2 p.m. So I'm going to set up the stream for 2 p.m. for part two for her to come in and she's going to be printing on various substrates. And then we will continue the class. Anybody have any questions? Let me know. If not, y'all, we are going to get um, off of here. Sylvia, so you should have in your Epson 4800 where I just went in and showed you those print options. Hopefully that helps. If y'all find that you have any questions, go ahead and if you find that you have questions, right, write down your questions so that at the very end of the classes, we can go in and we can, you know, we can address them. Okay. All right, y'all, I'm going to get off of here and go ahead and end this broadcast. I will see you guys in part two of the Sublimation Masterclass.